Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of uh, today, 29th of October 2020. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to co host you with my dear colleague, uh, Professor Mark Bakker uh, from TU Delft, a surprise event for our guests as well as the two of them know each other quite well. Thank you very much, Mark, for making yourself available and, and joining us today. Um, um, and also, uh, thank you all, the audience, for being with us again today, uh, helping us uh, combat work from home isolation. A special thanks to our all our keynote distinguished speakers who have supported this initiative too. Without them, this program wouldn't be a successful one. Uh, subscribe to the channel to access the archive um, and also receive notifications for the upcoming ones. The Tea Time Talk series also are run by junior researchers for everybody, especially for junior researchers, uh, PhD and postdocs, who could share their knowledge, science, and experiences about Poros Media. Uh, please do uh, attend their talk and connect with them, volunteer to give a talk there as well. Now to the lecture of this week. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker of this week is Professor Kemini Singa. A uh, professor in the Department of Geology and Geological Engineering at Colorado School of Mines. She's also the Associate Dean of Earth Resources and Environmental Programs. Her research interests are focused in hydrogeology and environmental geophysics. Kamini is an award winning teacher, a recipient of a US National Science Foundation Career Award, and the Early Career Award from the Society of Environmental and Engineering Geophysics a Geological Society of America fellow, and also she's a former Fulbright scholar as well. She was the Darcy Lecturer of 2017, selected by the US National Groundwater Association. Uh, for that, she had visited also TU Delft at our Faculty of Civil Engineering and Geosciences. Mark uh, was the main uh, host, and uh, I still remember the delicious Indonesian dinner. Mark, you hosted all of us, so that's uh, the tiny jokes of colleagal jokes I wanted to mention today in the webinar. And then also, she has also visited Harriot Watt for that a Darcy lecture too. And Sebastian uh, couldn't unfortunately make it until now. Uh, he would most probably hop on at any time uh, he can. Uh, she earned her bachelor degree in geophysics from the University of Connecticut and her PhD in hydrogeology from Stanford University. It's a pleasure and honor to host you, Kamini. Thank you very much for kindly accepting our invitation to the audience. Please note, her lecture will last for about 30 minutes. Uh, 31 or two would be fine as well. Uh, you don't, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, followed by questions and discussions. Like always, uh, please do type your questions in the chat box. And this time, uh, Mark would kindly go through them and share the discussion session. Uh, thank you all. The stage bandwidth, the screen is all yours, Kamini. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you all for joining me uh, today. And I'm super excited to talk about some work that's brand new to my group. So we are talking about work that we've just completed. So um, lots of things are in progress and hopefully there'll be a little something here for everyone because we'll be talking about physical processes and chemical things and biology, which makes me slightly uncomfortable, but I'm gonna uh, talk about all these things. I wanna highlight two people without whom I would have no data and no story to tell. Uh, Beth Hoagland is a postdoc in my group and um, a fantastic scientist that can sort of interface between hydrology and biogeochemistry, which you'll see. And then Ariel Rickle is a master's student who recently finished up who did some of the geophysics work that I'm gonna show you. So um, with that, let's get this party started. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the critical zone today, which I know is this term that for many people is an incredibly awkward term because everyone would like to think that the part of the earth that they work on is the critical part, right? But the terminology got coined almost 20 years ago to think about the piece of the earth that was critical because we as humans interface with it most. And that's the part that goes from sort of the atmospheric boundary layer down to the base of groundwater. And what makes critical zone science different than say traditional soil science or hydrogeology is that the idea is that we're looking at the interfaces between these sciences. So we're getting people that think about plant physiology in the same room as hydrogeologists, as atmospheric scientists, as geologists, as people that work on wireless sensor networks. And the idea is to start to think about these disciplinary areas more transdisciplinarily. So that's the idea of the sort of critical zone approach. And some of the sort of key processes that people have worked on over the years are things like, how do water and energy get into the subsurface? And then how do those things do work to turn rock into soil? 
how does that soil couple with what we understand about the, the ecosystem um, in terms of vegetation and how does vegetation then also produce soil? How does that change the hydrology of a system? How does that hydrology feed back with the vegetation and the soils? Um, people are thinking about terrestrial carbon and how it moves through the sort of carbon cycle. Um, and sort of maybe most importantly, it's how all of these processes are changing on a changing planet when um, clearly climate change is an issue, land use is, um, is an issue. Here in Colorado, where I am right now, everything is on fire. Um, and so how these, these, um, these, these big changes are changing the way some of these processes interact and feedback with one another. Um, for those of you that maybe are, are newer to critical zone science, Pam Sullivan put out this white paper called The New Opportunities for Critical Zone Science three years ago. It's fantastic. It really outlines, a, I forget how many tens of ideas for things that early career scientists might be interested in for these people that are interested in these, these cross-disciplinary sorts of sciences. So if you ask critical zone scientists what they would like um, to have information on, it's often sort of large scale distributions of things like porosity, bulk density, um, chemical and mineralogical composition of what's in the subsurface, mineral surface area. These things are all controlling sort of reactive transport in, in part. Uh, people are interested in root distributions, which is a very hard thing to get uh, information on. And I have your subsurface connectivity in quotes just because it's you know, there's a million ways to describe connectivity, but how things are connected um, and how that controls other processes is obviously of, of interest to many of us. So I am in part a geophysicist. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about geophysical data today, but I wanted to, to highlight this idea that I think um, geophysics can help contribute to some of those, those needs. And I think of a geophysical um, observation is sort of like a macroscope. You know, we all know a microscope where we look at something really small, but the idea of geophysics to me is that we can look at something really big where we might otherwise not have data. And, and worst case, I think of geophysics as a better way to interpolate between the soil pits or the boreholes that we standardly use, but better, it might be a tool that allows us to build hypotheses and think about where to take those point measurements that we're so dependent on um, to think about um, how, an, how an earth system might be behaving. So as an example, I'm showing you two papers here that are both from a, a watershed not far from where I am right now, uh, shown up in the right hand corner in the Boulder Creek Critical Zone Observatory. Now the, the image on the left, both of these I should say are seismic um, tomography images, but the image on the left um, that St. Clair put out in science, uh, basically noticed that the, the P wave velocity, so the broken up rock, the, the regolith, the part that um, can sort of sustain life, looked pretty similar on north facing and south facing slopes. Now, this was in contrast to what you're seeing on the right hand part of the slide, which is a paper from um, Bethes et al. and Beta Stone Journal, where they actually saw a much thicker regolith on the north facing slope than the south, and this is in the same watershed. And so there've been some questions within the critical zone community about the importance of aspect. And so the idea of the Bethes paper was, well, you know, when I see these large scale data over entire hill slopes, and I notice that the north facing slope is thicker, perhaps this has something to do with the fact that north facing aspects here in the northern hemisphere, where probably most of us are, um, are the pole facing slope, right? It's the, it's the north pole facing slope. And so it's the colder slope. It goes through more cycles of freeze thaw. Maybe that breaks up the rock more and we see deeper soils on those hill slopes. But in contrast to this image on the right, it doesn't see this. And so they said, well, actually, we don't know if we agree with this whole idea of pole facing slope being colder. And that maybe most of what we see in terms of the weathering in the system is controlled by the stress that a watershed feels. So um, I do think these data allow us to open up new questions and think about how to test them in ways that we can't get with the point measurements that we often have. The other thing that um, from a critical zone perspective that I think geophysics has been pretty interesting in is, is helping to contribute information about ecosystems, because it's often that, that you know, while geophysics and ecosystems aren't always thought to go together. This is a pretty old paper, but I think it's so cool that I talk about it all the time. Um, and what you're seeing in the upper right hand side of the slide is two images of electrical resistivity at two different times of year. Now you'll notice they've converted this to volumetric moisture. So they're saying this is about wetness, but it's really an image of electrical conductivity of the subsurface. But what you see is how that volumetric moisture varies across a really sharp ecotone from the forested part of the system to a grassland. And what you see, if you look in May, is that it is drier, deeper underneath trees than it is underneath grasslands. And this is probably not surprising in many ways because trees use 
you know, hundreds of liters of water a day compared to grasses, which are much smaller. And if we move to August, we see that that is just exacerbated. On the left hand side of the slide, what you see is this moisture difference between May and August with depth. And so what you see is that the grassland, yes, has a small difference between May and August and that that change goes down about half a meter. But when we look at the forest, we see big changes in moisture and those things go down to about three and a half meters. Now, what was cool about this data set to me is that they use this to parameterize roots in a hydrologic model, which is forever a complicated thing for us to think about how to get into hydrologic models. And then started to think about landscape hydrology and climate change, um, given, given the ecosystems on, um, on this landscape. So to me, I thought this was a really cool um, early paper looking at the use of geophysics to talk about things that we need in these coupled models. So um, back in 2015, a group of us were asked to, um, to put together a paper about critical zone geophysics. And honestly, this, um, this paper is sort of um, before the greatness that happened. So uh, we wrote this paper knowing that, that cr this idea of sort of critical zone science and geophysical imaging in the critical zone really hadn't hit its stride yet. And so I would say most of the great work that has happened in this sort of you know, geophysics is applied to some of these coupled problems. It's really happened since we wrote this paper in 2015. Um, but if you're interested in sort of the, you know, the beginnings of things and some of these, uh, these present, these data I just talked about, they do show up in this, in this paper. But I want to tell you a little bit about what's happened since then. So um, people have been thinking about, for instance, coupling between physical and chemical weathering. This is a data set from Jordan Hayes and uh, Science Advances from last year. What she's showing are some, again, seismic tomograms at the top through some rock physics relationships, she's converted those data to, to porosity. And I'm happy to talk about rock physics relationships at any time. I find them complicated and interesting. Um, but then from there, she was uh, also able to take those data and estimate strain in the, in the subsurface. Now, what was interesting is she had core data also from this site. And she uh, did some, some measurements on these cores. And one of the things that she's shown here on the far left is bulk tau. So for those of you that are geochemists, this um, might be familiar. For those of you are not, that are not, these negative numbers basically indicate that um, you're seeing weathering of certain materials out of the system, that certain um, uh, uh, different uh, chemical uh, constituents have been have been weathered out, and that's what that negative um, number is indicative to with respect to some parent material that they're using. Um, she's also looking at porosity and strain, and what she noticed in these data is when she looks at her core data, that the mass loss that she's seeing, this change in porosity with depth, really couldn't be explained by chemical weathering, and that she thought strain was perhaps what was driving weathering in this particular system. So these idea of coupled sciences, I think, have come a long way in recent years. Um, here's another quick example. Um, showing, a, again, a seismic image at the very top. You see um, some broken up material at the top, these lower velocities and more competent hard materials at the bottom with higher velocities. They're comparing that to an electrical image, which is often um, sensitive to a number of things, salinity and lithology and moisture and temperature. But um, here they were using it in part as a proxy for moisture. And uh, at the bottom, they've taken these two data sets as well as some core measurements to interpret what they thought was happening within the system in terms of where is the unweathered bedrock, where is the weathered bedrock, where is mobile, um, what's, you know, what, what does the subsurface look like in terms of hydrologic processes. Um, and so I, I do think this idea of, of coupling some of these measurements has, has come quite a long way in, in recent years. What I want to talk about today, though, is um, connectivity with respect to surface water groundwater exchange. and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about hyperreic zone processes. So this might be another term that for some people is newer. Um, this word comes from two Greek roots, hypos meaning below and rios meaning flow. It's not just the water that's below the stream, but it's also the um, any flow path that goes from surface water into groundwater and then back into surface water again, as shown here, going through this meander bend. Um, so this can go through the base of the stream. This can be lateral from the stream. And part of the reason this hyperreic zone is so important is that it, there's big gradients and things like um, dissolved oxygen and organic matter at this interface. So it's really a, a biological hotspot where we see um, metal uptake, we see processing of nutrients, um, there's thermal buffering for say fish refugia that's happening through this area. So this has been a really um, important area of research for probably you know, at least the last 20 years, if not longer, um, this, this idea of the hyperreic zone. So the one thing we know about um, stream corridors in general is that they, they are complex and the flow paths and the connectivity of these things are complex. And this is a, an old image from Kasahara and Wanzel from um, a water resources research paper. 
um, that's 17 years old. But what I like about it is that you can see how these flow paths that they're outlining here in red are really variable in terms of their length. Um, and this, of course, is one snapshot in time. So you can imagine that this changes seasonally or even with a vent as the discharge in the stream goes up and down. And of course, this ignores the whole sort of third dimension and what's happening in the base of the stream. So when we think about hyperreic zone processes, when we're interested in, in estimating properties about connectivity, what we often do are one of two things. Either we puncture our aquifer full of, of holes to the point that we are potentially looking at a system that no longer represents the permeability of the initial system. Um, or um, you and a, and a buddy get a trash can full of dye or salt and you add it to the stream and you look at how that dye uh, transports down gradient. And so you would plot a concentration history like the one shown here, um, that in a system that was infection and diffusion only would move through and look almost Gaussian. Um, but what we often see in, in stream systems, just like we see in groundwater systems, is, is stuff getting stuck. And we see these sort of longer tails and would be predicted by advection only. We then take these data, put them into models, uh, often one dimensional models in stream systems, and then estimate things like the area of the hyperreic zone and um, how quickly stuff can exchange between the stream and that hyperreic zone. And those tend to be the two sort of key properties that people, um, that people estimate. Now, that is sort of the, a backward fit, right? And so one of the questions you um, might ask is how we can also map that extent of the hyperreic zone without fitting it to breakthrough curves from, from in-stream data. Um, a number of years ago, uh, a, you know, we thought about whether we could use geophysics to do this. So if we use electrically conductive tracers, could we map then um, where the, the, the tracer that we introduced to the stream, if it was salty, for instance, where it moved into that hyperreic zone. Now, the reason we care about that area of the hyperreic zone is that's the area that's available to do sort of work. And um, by that, I mean biogeochemical work, which I'm gonna be honest, I have mostly avoided for most of my career um, because I'm not a biogeochemist, but in working with biogeochemists more recently, including Beth, um, um, we've been able to do some cool things that I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. Um, and so the idea of these images that you're seeing is that for any of these geophysical data, you're collecting data in the subsurface. And then what you're going to do is, is produce a map of the subsurface that's based on those data. So the idea is that you hope that the data that you collect in the field match what's being predicted by your model. And then that model that you're using is what you say the subsurface could look like. Now, there's a whole variety of assumptions that go into geophysical image reconstruction to make these models. You know, they're no longer data, right? We're looking at models of the subsurface um, that I'm not really gonna get into in this particular talk. Um, but I, I want you to know that what I am showing you when I show you those data are, are models based on data that, that um, were collected in the field. And so there, there's interpretation that goes with them. So um, here's an example of the very first time we tried to map the area of a hyperreic zone. So um, what I'm showing you are cross sections right now across a very small stream. We're looking at a stream corridor here of sort of 13, 14 meters and only down uh, about four meters into the earth. I am showing you tracer tests that were conducted at three different stream flows. You can see this is a very small stream. You could probably envision what four liters per second is. It's pretty small. Um, what you're seeing here of the yellow boundary is the size of the stream at each of these cases. Um, and this is three hours into a sodium chloride injection that goes into the ground. And as we continue to inject salt into the ground, what you see is, is not surprisingly, the stream gets really salty. But more interestingly, you see this lighting up of the area around the stream, that hyperreic zone um, contributing area. And, um, and then after we end the test, so six hours after we end, especially at high flow, you can see that the stream has gone back to background conditions, but there's this bathtub ring of salt that remains um, in the system. So one way to image hyperreic zone areas. And then we can take some of these data. Marty Briggs, uh, who's at the USGS, did some really nice work uh, with some analytical solutions, which is what the slide is, is going on with all these equations. But he uh, recognized that if you plot bulk conductivity as estimated by the geophysics with fluid conductivities that are co-located, you get an interesting hysteresis. Right, and all the hysteresis says is that the things on the two axes aren't changing at the same time, that the fluid conductivities are changing faster than those bulk conductivities that are sensitive to the hyperreic zone, and so it's slower paths. But from that, you can also estimate areas of hyperreic zones and rates of exchange. The other thing uh, we're going to talk about here today is process. So not only do we want to know how big the hyperreic zone is, but we want to know what's happening within it. 
And so I'm going to talk a little bit about CQ relationships or concentration discharge relationships where um, people plot uh, the uh, concentration of some constituent they're interested in and log space versus the log of the discharge of their particular stream. Now, what's interesting about this is if you think about how the discharge of a stream changes, um, it's interesting to think what happens to the concentration of different constituents. And as you can see from the plot here from um, Motor et al, um, from water resources research, there's a lot of possibilities of how things can happen. And so um, you can have chemostatic um, systems where you see no change in concentration with discharge. You could see um, mobilization that's happening here. So as the discharge goes up, so does the concentration. And so this is happens often enrichment um, from the flushing of solutes as that discharge goes up. And then down here in the bottom corner, what you're seeing is a dilution pipe signature, right? So what you're seeing is as discharge goes up, concentration goes down, and this is often associated with source limitation. So you can start to talk about these constituents and the processes that might be happening within these streams by looking at these sorts of data. And oftentimes people will uh, calculate the power loss slope from these curves and use that to interpret, you know, mobilization versus dilution versus the sort of chemostatic situation. Now, what's cool about these, um, these data or these power loss slopes that people are calculating is you can start to ask questions like, what are the sources of stream water under differing flow conditions? And what processes matter in terms of solute generation, you know, biogeochemistry or transport? And uh, very few people have looked to date at the role of the hyperreic zone with respect to trace metal export. And that's what we're gonna do today. So one thing I wanna note is that the use of that power loss slope alone to interpret chemostatic behavior, the idea of nothing changing, can be misleading because we can see big uh, variability in concentrations, even when B is really small. So what I'm gonna show you today are um, these power loss slopes with respect to the coefficient of variation of the concentration of a particular solute normalized by that of the discharge. So we still can uh, point out mobilization and dilution behavior, um, and we'll define chemostatic as things with small power loss slopes, but also small ratios of coefficients of variation. So um, that's how we'll do it in this, this talk today. So, um, we are going to talk about some exchange controls today. Here's our field site or one of our field sites in Colorado. We're going to look at controls of hyperreic zone on acid mine drainage and also ask the question, does the hyperreic zone mediate metalloid transport? And if so, how, when, and where? And these are um, two papers, one of um, Beth's that's in Frontiers of Water and one of Ariel's in Geophysics. These have actually both just recently come back from review. Here's Beth looking very happy. All right, so here are our field sites. Um, they're down in southwestern Colorado uh, in the old mining belt of Colorado. So there was a ton of mining in Colorado in general. And this map um, down here of the state uh, shows you all these little black dots are old mines. So uh, we're working in the upper Animus watershed. The Animus itself is this blue streak coming out of the bottom of Colorado uh, in two smaller creeks known as Mineral Creek and Cement Creek. And um, this area is, is somewhat well known in the US um, because of the Gold King mine spill in 2015. So um, this was a, um, an EPA contractor, a, an environmental protection agency contractor was working on an old addict that had been plugged and accidentally released um, about $11 million, $11 million, so it's only 11 million liters of um, acid mine drainage into the, into the cement creek and down through the Animus River, which is what this animation is sort of showing the migration of metals uh, within the system that was predicted uh, by a variety of folks. Um, so the Animus River, which is a, a popular area for boating and fishing, um, was bright orange for uh, a period of time and uh, impacted uh, Navajo lands. It was, it, was, it was kind of a big, kind of a big deal. So um, we're going to work in that, that same location right up here where that spill happened. All right, so here are two systems. Here's Mineral Creek and here's Cement Creek. And um, th we're gonna use them as comparison sites. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how they're different here in just a second. Um, what we're gonna do is some tracer injections in both systems. We're gonna have um, some EC, electrical conductivity loggers downstream. We're gonna have a stilling well so we can measure the change in discharge. And then we have a bunch of wells where we can um, take a look at sampling, including some in-stream samples, some hyperreic zone uh, samples, and then we also have uh, some, some control on groundwater at both sites. Um, these two sites are different in part because of the way the stream looks. So Cement Creek is named that appropriately because the base of it is completely cemented by ferrocrete. So um, <clears throat> this has got a, a whole bunch of iron basically lining the base of the stream, whereas Mineral Creek uh, does not have that um, that ferrocrete lining. So if we look at these two systems, Cement and Mineral Creek, we did two tracer tests at each site, 
one at sort of higher flows here at the end of July and one at lower flows in September. And so there's you know, a bit going on in this table, but the important part to, to know is that yes, we did two tracer tests, one at high flow, one at low flow, the size of the stream got smaller. So it was less wide, less deep and had less area in both systems um, between the first test and the second. But um, what I want you to notice is that the two tests, the two systems themselves are quite different. So Cement Creek has low pH in general compared to, to Mineral Creek, which is closer to being neutral. Um, Cement Creek's got a, a pH of sort of um, three to four, depending on the time of year. It's also got a much higher electrical conductivity. And not surprisingly, because the um, stream bed is cemented, it's got a lower hydraulic conductivity based on some slug tests that we did. So uh, we did some tracer tests. Uh, here's the breakthrough curves from Cement Creek. Uh, the data are shown in black dots. And then we did some um, model fits, both with and without um, hyperreic exchange flows considered. And um, at high flow and low flow, and one of the things we estimated was this alpha, which is the rate at which stuff exchanges between the stream and the hyperreic zone. The number might not mean much. It looks a bit like diffusion over a length scale squared. And then we estimated also the ratio of the area of that that hyperreic zone to the area of the stream. Now, what you notice is that the exchange rate is pretty similar between the two, but the area of exchange decreases as we get to this lower stream discharge case. So the hyperreic zone shrinks a bit from high uh, discharge to low discharge. Um, so we're going to compare these numbers to what we see in Mineral Creek. So we'll kind of keep in mind it's sort of 0.2-ish and 1 times 10 to the minus 3. When we get to Cement Creek, which again is cemented, um, what we end up seeing is uh, a much lower exchange rate um, and so we're seeing uh, values that are sort of a fifth as big. And what we're seeing in terms of that exchange area doesn't change too much between um, uh, two, these, these two flows. And, um, but the, the area in general of the, the hyperreic exchange in Mineral Creek is quite a bit bigger because it doesn't have that, that ferrocrete in place. Um, so five times the exchange and, I don't know, three or four times the hyperreic area in Mineral Creek, the one that's not cemented. Now, what that does is that changes, of course, the, the chemistry that we see within the stream. What I'm trying to indicate in these data is here's Cement Creek, the one that's cemented on the, the left. Here's Mineral Creek, which is not on the right. This light blue arrow in both cases is the sort of approximate depth of the hyperreic zone is based on our, our models that I just showed you um, at, at low flow. And then the, the deep, deeper blue line is the extent of the hyperreic zone at, at high flow. Here in Mineral Creek, the extent of the hyperreic zone goes down to about 1.8 meters. So it goes off the base of the of where we have data uh, in terms of the chemistry. Here at Cement Creek, what I'm indicating at about 40 centimeters is the depth of that ferrocrete uh, layer um, that, that really impedes flow. One of the things that we see in Cement Creek is there's a partitioning of these metalloids that we see uh, different chemistry above the ferrocrete as we see below. I want to point out that um, there is a part of the reason there's a big kick out here at Mineral Creek is that we do see at our deepest point uh, much higher concentrations in some of these metalloids, but the scales, I had to change them just so you could see anything at all. So some, a couple of these, including aluminum and magnesium in particular, have very different scales from one to the other. The others are, are pretty similar except for iron down here. Um, but there's much more aluminum, magnesium, and iron in Cement Creek than we see in Mineral Creek. So when we take those concentration data that Beth has collected and compare them to discharges at different times of year, here is the plot I told you about of the power loss slope um, against the, the variance of concentration and discharge. And here are all of her data. Uh, Cement Creek is shown in red, uh, both dissolved in total uh, uh, concentration, and then in, in, in blue, you're seeing Mineral Creek. So one of the things that you'll see in these data, which is interesting, is that in general, we're seeing positive power loss slopes at Mineral Creek. So we're seeing things mostly above the zero line or more likely above the zero line, indicating that mobilization, that enrichment uh, behavior, whereas we're seeing something very different at Cement Creek. We see these negative uh, power loss slopes for the most part, which indicate dilution. So um, that, the other thing that is in these data is that you'll see a difference in B, so that power loss slope, between the, the total and the dissolved samples. So some of these samples are filtered, some are, are not. Um, and that particularly for aluminum, iron, copper, and magnesium, um, we see a, a smaller difference in Cement Creek than we do at Mineral Creek, which implies that we're seeing more metals being transported as collo colloids or attached to particles in Cement Creek than we're seeing at Mineral Creek. And that's what this plot down here is trying to indicate, and that this is happening quickly, but we can also, um, I'm happy to share Beth's paper, um, power loss slope versus that ratio of dissolved to total um, metal metalloids in her system. So um, 
I also wanted to show you some of the electrical imaging of the system. Now, we had some problems with uh, the data from Mineral Creek, sadly, and so I'm going to show you Cement Creek, which is, um, again, the one with the ferrocrete in it. Here is an electrical resistivity line that uh, Ariel put in place um, to sort of see if she could image that extent of hyperreic zone like we, like we talked about. So here are her images, so these models that she's made uh, based on data of the electrical conductivity of the subsurface. Uh, both at high flow and low flow. They look reasonably similar to one another in both systems. It is very conductive over here on this right-hand side. There's a big iron fin, um, so an iron uh, a groundwater fed area in this area that's super iron rich. And it's, there's uh, metals even on the surface of this, of this system. So very conductive over on this end, you sort of see the stream. Um, what we did was introduce a sodium chloride tracer. And that's what's happening here for the high flow on the left and the low flow on the right. Now, what you see are, is a change now in conductivity from the background, just like we were seeing in those earlier images. And the important thing to notice is mostly that at, at these higher flows, that you see the changes persist longer than we do in the low flows over here, which indicates that from the resistivity data that we're, we're seeing a higher residence time, that wa water is hanging out longer actually in these higher flows in the hyperreic zone. At the very bottom, for those of you that are geophysicists and interested, this is what the, the resolution matrix looks like of her model. She also um, looked at those hysteresis curves that Marty Briggs had, um, had modeled using those, um, both her bulk conductivity data uh, based on the geophysics and her fluid conductivity data but based on the in-stream measurements, which is what's being shown over here, the fluid conductivity is in orange. The average of her bulk conductivity data from the geophysics, not the model, um, shown in blue. And she's plotting these hysteresis curves. And what you see is that there isn't a very strong hysteresis at low flow, which indicates very little exchange between the bulk and the, the between the stream and the hyperreic zone. Um, but there's a, a more notable hysteresis at these higher flows, indicating that we see more exchange, a bigger hyperreic area. Um, and this matches generally what we saw from the tracer test alone. So what this allowed us to do is, was build some conceptual models of the system. So one here is for Cement Creek. Um, so this is the one that, again, has the ferrocrete layer that's shown. We know that this has low hydraulic conductivity sediment. So what we're seeing is a much smaller hyperreic area and less exchange because we're, um, we're sort of bound by the low permeability of the, um, the material in the subsurface. We found these negative power loss slopes for um, many of the metalloids within this system, that dilution trend. And that reflects that the influence of, of hill slope flow is probably what's, what's changing the uh, concentrations within the system rather than, than in-stream processes. As we see increases in um, discharge, we're seeing more flushing. We see something very different in Mineral Creek. So this has much higher hydraulic conductivity sediment. We're seeing a larger hyperreic area. We're seeing more exchange between the stream and the hyperreic zone. And so what we have in this case is a, a mixing of the, the metal rich groundwater that's coming out of these old mine addicts um, with the, the oxygen rich stream water in the hyperreic zone. And we're getting precipitation of metal oxides out um, of this system in the subsurface. And that's leading to some of the, power, the positive power loss slopes that we're seeing. Now, uh, here's where things get really uncomfortable for me in particular, but um, just to give you a taste, um, Beth has, uh, actually, this is, I, this is incorrect. This is not in this paper. Um, she has been working on um, species diversity. So looking at who, what, what um, microbial communities are present uh, in these systems, in groundwater, pore water, and sediment. And these are two different measures of diversity that are being shown here. You don't necessarily need to think about one or the other. I probably should have shown one plot. Um, we don't have very many groundwater samples, but one of the things that you'll see is that there is notably more diversity uh, in Mineral Creek than there is in Cement Creek. And so this may be a function of hydraulic, uh, hydrologic conduct conductivity that's supporting these uh, microbial communities. It may also be a function of the, the geochemistry of these systems. But um, you do see a, a big difference in, in who is present and the diversity of who is present in Mineral Creek um, when compared to Cement Creek. And it's, it's harder to tell in the sediment itself. In fact, it may even be slightly reversed in the sediment. So this is work that's, that's coming, and she's still sort of thinking through why we have this. So um, to sort of wrap this up, because I know I don't have a ton of time, this is a short talk, which is kind of fun. Um, what we sort of came away with is what does this mean for these acid mine impacted systems in terms of how we, we treat them, especially in these, um, these areas that have been so strongly impacted by a legacy of mining. So for these disconnected systems, like the one with the sparacrete layer, um, we're probably looking at things like um, subsurface reactive barriers and removal and treatment of sediments. 
Um, whereas remediation efforts in these systems that are still well connected um, could focus more on stream water treatment. Um, and it just isn't going to be that effective in these, these bare uh, lined here, lines, uh, lined systems like this one here. And so um, I guess also the other thing I want to point out is that um, that by taking sort of a critical zone approach, uh, what Beth has been able to do is, is look at connections between the hydrology, the biogeochemistry, and even the geophysics to tell a bit of a story about these two systems in a way that I think um, is really cool and, and, and only moderately uncomfortable for me when I think about biology. Um, for those of you that are interested in critical zone science, I just want to make a plug also in my last minute um, for um, a National Science Foundation funded um, program that we have that is specifically to bring in new folks to critical zone science because um, I think there's some strength in this approach in terms of thinking across disciplinary areas. It doesn't have to be critical zone science, but anytime we can think across disciplinary areas. But I do find for, for many people that are sort of thinking about earth and environmental science, this has been a really fun new home for many people. So if you're interested in critical zone science, please um, check out our website. We're trying to host um, webinars and seminars, especially for early career researchers. And this includes undergrads. So if you know people that are um, really just starting to think about environmental and earth science, um, we'd love to have them too. But we have a lot of graduate students and postdocs and um, pre-tenure faculty members um, involved as well. And, um, and that's it. I think that's the end of my time. Um, this is my email address. If you are interested, I'm on Twitter. And then our uh, the handle for that, that, um, that program I was just telling you, Join CC Science, is also here. So with that, um, I think that is it. And I'm happy to take questions if there are some. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this very informative uh, talk. Uh, uh, I would like to just hand over to Mark to chair the rest of the session. Um, I see already many questions posted, but I, I'm, I trust Mark has plenty also himself. So Mark, the stage is yours. Thanks. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you, Kamini, for uh, doing such a great job in your talk. Uh, there are some, indeed some questions posted um, on the chat. If you have any more, please uh, please put them in there. The very first question came from uh, Lela, and uh, if I, I think it's Lila, but I, it's hard to see for me. Um, and it's a general question about geophysics, uh, but that's a very good one that I always struggle with, is what's the typical resolution as a function of depth? And, and how can we do 3D or can we just do 2D cross sections? Lila, great question. Um, so yes, there's so, so many things in there that are important. So in terms of how deep we can see, it's actually a function of a couple of things. And one of which is how conductive the subsurface is, which unfortunately is the thing we're trying to find. So we often don't know that a priori and how we set up the electrodes. Um, and so you can imagine sort of a worst case scenario in, in, in part, which we were working in, which is if you had a system that has a conductive metal at the near surface um, and you would go to inject current within that system, most of the current is going to traverse across that, that metal and you'll get very little penetration into the ground. And so that's sort of the worst case scenario. Um, and so how deep we can see, um, you know, it is, is hard for us to quantify in advance. And so that resolution matrix that I had plotted is the sort of geophysicist's way of saying, well, how, what, to what depth do my data seem to inform the model? And below which depth is it sort of more waving its hands at what's there? A rule of thumb that we often use for sort of standard um, systems that aren't sort of metal lined, like the one I'm talking about here, is that about 90% of the current that we inject into the ground goes to the depth of the electrode spacing. So if my electrodes are five meters apart, most of the current might go down about five meters. If my electrodes are 10 meters apart, maybe I get down 10 meters. So it, it depends quite a bit on these, on these two things and it's hard to quantify in advance, unfortunately, which sometimes makes these, these methods a little harder to use. In terms of three dimensions, yes, um, absolutely. People do uh, do three dimensions. And the only reason I, um, I tend to shy away from three dimensional data sets is one of the, the struggles with using electrical imaging in stream systems, especially during tracer tests, is how quickly you need to collect data. So most people that are trained as geophysicists aren't also trained as, as hydrogeologists. And we set up these arrays and we collect data for many hours often in the field. But as a, as a hydrologist, especially someone working in streams, changes are happening really quickly. And so we try to figure out how to generate a geometry that we can collect in the field that um, would collect data, say, every five to 10 minutes instead, which leaves us with poorer quality images than you would get if you could collect data for many hours, but at least it's it's something. And in three dimensions, there's so many unknowns in those models that you make for the number of data you have that um, 
they just don't have a lot of fidelity. So coming back to your, your, your question, there aren't enough data to really parameterize a three-dimensional model with the speed that we have to collect data. So um, yes, generally people can do three-dimensional imaging. I, I just can't because of the speed at which we're, we're collecting our data. It's a great question. So if, if I can add to that, what, what if there is already uh, something that's uh, highly conductive in the ground, like a steel pipe from a well? Uh, yeah. Is that causing trouble? It can, yeah. Oftentimes we see them because current will channel around it. If it's something small like a, a steel well and you're you've got a large array, um, you might you might be okay. You, it might you might get some current going through it, and you'll probably see it in your image. Um, people have actually used steel wells as giant electrodes in some studies, so they've actually just driven current on the steel well bore. Um, and so there's some people that have worked on having a giant steel electrode rather than the little point sources that our models use. Um, so so yeah, you you can end up seeing these these features. Now, if you have a steel um, well and you're looking at a little tiny grid that's only a few meters long, you you might um, you might have some some unfortunate images that are hard to see much. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Johan, and, and it, it had to do with when you showed the uh, uh, picture of the, of the subsurface. Um, would you share your idea about how to quantify the connectivity of subsurface systems? And, and to follow up, how, how heterogeneous is it? Well, you know, it's very heterogeneous most of the time. Yeah, so. Johan, that's a, that's a great question. And I feel like this is like the million dollar question, right? I was just listening to this really great talk by um, Ellen Wohl, who is a um a, a beaver dam geomorphologist yesterday and she was talking about um how do we quantify connectivity in the systems and the importance of, of beavers in terms of um building up the the mosaic the complexity of a stream corridor um and so i think this is a problem that many of us struggle with who think about connection and connectivity is how to quantify that and so um i will admit that in this case we haven't come up with a, a quantitative way yet maybe ever we'll see with these data um, to describe something as um, as having a number of, of that says that something is more connected or less connected we can certainly tell in the, the chemical data that we have here and the way the tracers behave and the geophysical images that we have one system that is is poorly connected and another that is comparatively better connected right but that does not answer your question which is about quantifying that piece and i think it's it's Man, it's a struggle. It's like trying to quantify tortuosity sometimes too, right? It depends on the scale that you look at as to you know what you see. Um, so I, I wish I had a better answer for you. I'm, I'm going to punt a bit on your question because I think it's hard and I, I, I don't actually know a, I the right way to do this. Um, but I, I think that's an awesome question that we should all be thinking about <laughs> good. Um, how to do more. Yeah, very good. Um, then Sarah has a question and I'm, I'm not going to pronounce your last name, Sarah. Apologies for that. Um, <sighs> The question is, does the temperature change through the year play any major role in the data acquisition and connection with the model and simulation? Yes, yeah, Sarah, awesome question. Yes, so absolutely. So um, there are three things that sort of control electrical geophysical data through time, um, and that is temperature, salinity, and moisture content. So um, we were sort of chalking up our differences primarily to salinity, right? We introduced a tracer and said, well, these other two things. What I didn't tell you is yes, there's a big temperature piece in there that we have to correct for. So there are temperature sensors, um, both in the stream and in the stream bed that we use to, um, to correct uh, changes in conductivity associated with temperature. And so, um, yeah, that, that is a, a non-trivial step. There is a, a few papers by um, a fellow named Kevin Haley, who's down in Australia, that did sort of the work on um, how to correct these sorts of data or these sorts of images. You can correct the data or the images. There's two different ways to do this um, for temperature, because otherwise, yeah, you could see big temperature big temperature swings. And in fact, to go on a total tangent to your question, um, I ended up in a, in a research project because of that temperature correction. I was working in two watersheds doing tracer tests. And what we see, especially for um, tracer tests that run over multiple days, is you see this dial variation in electrical conductivity just as a function of temperature. And so we yep. went to, um, to correct for that. And um, and when we were in one of the watersheds had a lot of riparian vegetation and one did not. And so in the system without riparian vegetation, when we corrected for temperature, oh, the conductivity yeah. no longer changed. But in the one that had riparian vegetation, we still saw these swings. And I was super upset about it because this is a problem for me. And I showed this to a forest hydrologist and she said, wow, you're probably seeing tree water uptake. And so it was the moisture oh. piece of the story. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up uh, working with a forest hydrologist on tree water uptake, which is something I never thought I would do, uh, would do because over beer, 
talking about your question, I um, you know showed this this signature, and she said, "I wonder if this is what you're seeing." So, yes, and it, it turns out that um, it's not the only the only diurnal change we see in some systems. Like I just said. Yeah. So, but do I sense correctly then that temperature is something you correct for, and it's not something you can measure? Uh, we do measure. Sorry, we do measure. So we measure um, we measure temperature, and then we use those temperature measurements to correct the conductivity data. So, um, uh, okay. but yes, so, so you can you get two D can you get two D cross sections of temperature? Yeah. So we we do that a little bit. So we usually have uh, measurements in the stream and in the stream bed at multiple depths, and we often do that in two or maybe three locations along the transect. So we don't have a full sort of map of temperature, but we often say that you know once you're away from the stream. You know that we see the change that we see at five centimeters here would be the sort of similar to the change we would see at five centimeters laterally a few more meters and so we tend to interpolate those temperature data that we have over the the space that we have it okay uh, it's, it's interesting because we've been doing heat tracer experiments and we we actually try to uh, insert sensors vertically into the ground and we, we normally use uh, fiber optic cables that go like 20 30 meters down Oh, wow. um, but then you also get it along that one line and then we measure it with uh, distributed temperature sensing. So you shoot a laser through it and you get it back. Uh, but that also gets it along the, along that line. That's already better than, than at a point. But I'd like an image, right? But Yeah, I know. DTS is so cool that way. I mean, we've been using, a, because we're only looking down, you know, a meter. So we're looking down yep. really shallowly in these systems. We basically are building little um wooden stakes where we drill a small hole for a eye button sensor and then we put three eye mm -hmm. buttons on a wood dowel and then shove it yep. into the ground is what we're doing so that dts is much fancier even than what we're doing yeah all right thank you uh Lila has a second question um what are the main conceptual mo models relevant for this application to appropriately connect the surface water with the underground water yeah um Layla, this is also a really good question That's not easy yeah, it, it isn't. And it, so there's some common models that are used, and one can argue whether they accurately describe um, subsurface systems. So I didn't mention, but the model that I showed here was Otis. Sorry, I used Otis and Stamped Out, so I had to think for a second, where the, the Otis models. And so Otis is um, O T I S is a, um, a code that was written by um, uh, Rob Runkle at the US Geological Survey, and it assumes one dimensional flow along a stream. You have exchange that goes from a, a cell in your model from the stream into the hyperreic zone and back, but there is no ex, there is no transport of solutes within the hyperreic zone itself. So the stream has one dimensional flow. It communicates with the pixel below it that indicates its hyperreic zone, and and that's sort of how that that model works. Um, Stamped L is is not dissimilar um, in in its assumptions, although it's got some different. Um, residence time models than Otis. So some people have been making these three-dimensional models that try to um, allow for you know, flow and transport in groundwater, which we know happens, and then flow and transport within the stream. Of course, the time scales of these two things are really different, which is probably why the assumption that you know, there isn't transport in the hyperreic zone you know, over the time scales um, that we're seeing flow and transport in streams exists in Otis and in Stampdale, but um, people like Audrey Sawyer, for instance, have been doing some really amazing work looking at three-dimensional models using things like console to, um, to describe uh, flow and transport between these things. But you'll see a lot of these one-dimensional models still because they're simple. And um, you know, there's always this question about how complex do we make a model for the data that we have? And you know, Otis is nice in that it's a really nice, simple model that certainly misses a lot of the um, complexities in the subsurface, but um, but allows us at least to move forward with a couple of simple parameters that might be things we can measure. These these large 3D models that um, have a lot of knobs we can twist are really cool for sort of hypothesis testing, but we often don't have the data to parameter parameterize them very well anyway. And so I don't think there's a, a uh, one size fits all answer to your question that sometimes we, you know, we use the model that sort of best helps us move forward with the, the data that we have in the system that we have. Um, so it, me, I, I, as a civil engineer, I, I'm less interested in the chemistry, although the chemistry is cool. Um, but I'm interested in, in the basic principle of, of stream bed resistance, resistance to water flow. Uh, can you make a better estimate using your techniques than, than just, you know, the, the regular things that we do? We put like a, a little device in the stream and we try to measure the flow across at a point across the stream bed. 
Uh, do you when get you, a better estimate than, than we do? I mean, so, so when you say um, resistance, you're thinking like like a Mannings or something, right? You're thinking about resistance along the stream bed. No, the resistance for groundwater to leak into what's into the stream oh, to or, yeah, or yeah, the yeah. other way around for like yeah. stream depletion, for example. Yeah. So. Um, so I think my favorite way to do this is what you're doing, right? Which is distributed temperature sensing. At least it gives us an indication of upwelling flows, right? So okay. I think that- I mean, we, I mean, we haven't done, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I think GPS I know people is do that, cool. yeah. Yeah, I, that I think is my favorite way because the resolution is so high. You know, of course it only tells you about upwelling and only at certain times of year when the groundwater is notably colder than the surface water. Um, it doesn't tell us about downwelling very well. And so, um, then those temperature stakes, like I was talking about, can be helpful because then you can actually see that downwelling component. With the geophysics, I think we can image with tracers um, some of that the, that sort of hyperreic piece, but we can't really see the details of upwelling or downwelling. We just see blob, right? So we know that stuff got down there, but we don't exactly know um, what what small path it might have taken to do that. And so I do think temp temperature to me is still the way to get at that. Um, that exchange piece from surface water to groundwater. At least that's my favorite way because it's DTS is, is largely continuous. You can put temperature stakes in places where you think there might be downwelling, which is better than say seepage meters, which I'm sure you've used, which are hard to put in place and giant and a pain. So I don't know, I think temperature might be my favorite option for that, but the electrical imaging can be handy in terms of maybe thinking about where those downwelling zones could be, but it's so it's so blurry, right? It's like the beer goggles version of the subsurface that it's hard to mm -hmm. say exactly where that's happening. Okay, thank you. Do you have any more questions, Hadi? Or I do not see, uh, uh, and the time is also close to be over. If uh, Thank you very much. Let me just uh, close the session by thanking uh, can I, all of you. Can I oh, ask please one go more? ahead. Okay, can, I, can I ask one non-scientific oh, oh. question? Oh, I can't um, <laughs> It's, well, it, it's, you know, we, it, we are in the time of conspiracy theories, right? So you showed, you showed the Gold King mine spill in 2015, which I, if I, if I remember correctly, you had an interesting Republican candidate for president. And um, the, the gold mine spill was orange. And you like the mines. Is there any connection, you think? You know, it's uh, it's one of these ones that I haven't really spent much time studying myself. So um, I'm gonna have to look into it and get back to you on that one because I'm I'm not sure if there's um if that's correlation or causation. Okay, well, an and he's probably listening in, so uh, we have to be careful. <laughs> but thank you. No, well, thank sorry you. about that, No, uh, no, no. This is a non-scientific question. Of well, that. actually, this matter as well. So, but that was an excellent <laughs> question to end this scientific event, also. But we should be also so societally relevant as well, if I wanted to stay diplomatic. So. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, uh, you, Kamini, and Mark, uh, as well, and all the audience for the great uh, questions. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to announce the next speaker uh, is uh, Professor Hamdi Chalapi from Stanford University, Energy Resources Engineering Department. Hamdi would speak about physics in form machine learning for multiphase flow in porous media. Until next week, the same time, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time, 3 p.m. UK, 7 a.m. California, and everywhere else. Uh, please stay happy, healthy, and uh, tuned. And we see you all again next week with yet another geoscientific and geoenergetic talk. Thanks all again, and goodbye. Thank you, Mark. Kemini as well. Thank you. Thank you.